All right, so we're going to be talking about um, the end of the world. I've entitled this uh, presentation Hitchhiker's Guide to the End of the World, and I think that um, this topic has really emerged, oh gosh, since the pandemic, I would say, the um, topic of the end of the world, what the church believes about the end of the world, what's going to happen at the end of the world, this is a topic that has become more popular among Christians and non-Christians alike, and a lot of that has to do with um, just the nature of the world we've been in since the pandemic and so many things happening, war in the Middle East and in Israel with Hamas, uh, the country itself and the, the, the society around us sort of learning uh, that we are not immune to apocalyptic times. Uh, you know, we, and we, we millennials and Gen Xers and, and many of us who live, are alive in this generation haven't really um, lived in a time before where we've seen so much um, upheaval that really feels apocalyptic. And so there's a g genuine curiosity about there, out there about the end of the world. And I think there's a lot of confusion about what Christians believe about the end of the world. And so that's why I decided to actually do this presentation was to help those who are in the church, but more so those of those who are outside of the church, to kind of give them a um, an understanding of what the church has historically believed about the end of the world, because it's not monolithic. There's not like one belief about the end of the world that all Christians agree to. So um, it's important that we understand that, that there's actually a lot of different views about the end of the world, and most of them are just guesses because we don't know really what's going to happen or if there is actually going to be sort of this climactic end of the, end of the world. You know, we, we tend to think that because we are finite beings and we feel like everything needs a, a beginning and an ending, but honestly, we don't know. We'll know when it happens. All we can do really is infer, but um, there are different interpretations and in, in, inferences that have been made by Christians through the centuries. And so I want to give a little background on that. So this is part one. I'm going to do a part two. It goes into more of the um, actual belief systems. But in this uh, particular um, uh, presentation, I'm just going to be given sort of some foundational stuff about the end of the world and what has been historically believed by the by Jewish people, by the church, uh, and by early Christians. So don't panic. Uh, I feel like, you know, uh, when we talk about the end of the world, there's a lot of anxiety. It raises a lot of anxiety in us <clears throat> because it is scary to think about. And, and especially when you hear some of the ways that Christians teach about the end of the world that involve like, you know, tribulation and heads rolling and all that kind of stuff, it can be very scary. So um, but don't panic, you know, if there is the end of the world and if you are a Christian and, um, and, 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 and you believe that the Lord is working all things out for the good of those who love him, then there's no reason to panic. It's just, uh, we have to just trust God. God has a plan and whatever that plan is, God is going to see it to pass. And that's just the way that it is. So don't panic, but we should have an understanding, especially because what we believe about the end is going to affect how we act in the present. And this has been my biggest argument about bad eschatology. Uh, eschatology is the study of, uh, obviously is a study of the end, end of the world or, or end time things. And bad eschatology, which in my opinion is, is eschatology that teaches that God is just going to burn the world up and redo it, um, really lends itself to, um, to, to, to those who believe it, it they, they typically don't really have a vision for the future of the earth. So they're not really into, you know, climate control. They're not really into passing down a better world to future generations because, and they're really not into ending war because they believe all those things have to take place, especially in the Middle East. And so that's why bad eschatology, in my opinion, is some of the worst theology that the church can teach because what you think about where you're headed really affects how you act in the present. So this video, uh, part one here, we're going to be talking about um, apocalyptic literature in the Bible because that's where most of the theology of the end times comes from, is from apocalyptic literature. Um, we're going to talk about what Jesus taught and what the first Christians believed about the end of the world, and then we're going to talk about um, the different theories that most Christians believe today about the end of the world. Now, some of this will go into part two, and we'll try to cover as much as possible here in part one. And then I'll do a separate video um, 
for time's sake and talk about the remainder uh, of this content. <clears throat> so let's talk about apocalyptic literature. I used to get razzed in church because I talked about apoc apocalyptic literature a lot. I think it's one of the most important genres in the Bible. It's also one of the most misunderstood genres in the Bible. So hopefully this will clear some of that up. So what is apocalyptic literature? Well, apocalyptic literature is literature that um, emerged primarily after the first uh, Jewish um, exile when the when they actually came back from exile and they were you know they came out of Babylon Persia these different empires that had transitioned before they returned but when they came back uh, when the Jews came back to their homeland they then reflected on the events that had happened and so a lot of that emerged like the book of Daniel some other things uh, we'll talk about it in a moment some other books emerged during this time the word apocalypse um, comes from the Greek, and it means to show or tell something that was not known before, like a big reveal. You know, imagine a magician, you know, lifting the curtain and showing the person gone or um, the curtains opening. You see in the set of a, of a play for the first time, you know, another analogy would be and you see this in, in, in the Bible from time to time, this idea of scales falling off the eyes or like curtains opening to the eyes. That's what apocalypse means. And so you have the exile. The Jewish people are responding to the trauma of all of that, you know, all of that history. And they're trying to preserve it. And they're also trying to hand it down to future generations. And I want to say something very important here about the way we think about history in the ancient world. In the modern world, like post-enlightenment, um, history really became about the dates and the numbers and the timelines and, and, and all that kind of thing, right? And that's how we... That's that's how we want our history in modern times. We want there to be like evidence of it. We want there we want to be able to say, well, on this day this happened, and this person did that. It's very linear and it's very evidence based. In ancient times, they really didn't think like that. You know, the Enlightenment hadn't happened yet. There was um, wasn't like this huge scientific revolution. Of course, there's always been science of some form. People have been studying the world around them forever, the natural world. But um, it wasn't, you know, like it was in the modern times where science really became uh, the main informer of what we believe about the world and, 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 and everything around us. But for ancient people, history was really about um, it was about uh, the meaning of things, not the dates and the times. They wanted to capture what things meant, right? Like what things mattered. And so that's why um, some of the history was preserved apocalyptically, because apocalypse, and we'll talk about this in just a moment, but apocalyptic literature as a genre has a very unique literary device that is able to preserve meaning more than just about anything else, and that's symbolism, especially when you use symbolism of the world that's around us, like moon and stars and sand and dirt and dust and blood and breath and sweat and all that kind of stuff, right? Because that stuff transcends generations. It's not going away. No matter how the technology changes, no matter how the socio-philosophical uh, world changes, none of that matters, right? What matters is, is um, these, you know, the symbols, right? Because they, they, you're always going to have them, and they matter because that's part of the natural world. Uh, it is disputed by, and this is why. It is disputed by scholars whether the events described in apocalyptic literature have already happened or yet to happen or a combination of both. I find, especially in my tradition, um, which is uh, more Pentecostal charismatic, that people tend to read apocalyptic literature very literally, right? Like they literally believe, you know, the sun's going to turn to blood or the moon's going to turn to blood and the sun's going to be blackened. They genuinely believe that like scorpions and revelation are going to come out of the ground and kill people. Um, so, and, and they, and they typically believe not only literally, but they believe that all these things are for the future. Um, however, on the other hand, you know, most academic scholars will tend to read these passages as reflections on the past. Um, and then some people, like myself, believe that it's a combination of both. And here's why. And this is getting way ahead of myself, but this is probably the most important part of my theology about the end of the world and the apocalypse. Uh, 
I believe that it is a combination of both because everything that happens just keeps happening. And I think that's why in Revelation it says these are the things that uh, were and the things that are and the things that will be. It's not saying that there's this linear like timeline um, of things that were and are and are to be. I think it's saying that there's this cycle, right, that there's a cycle. And you see this cycle throughout Scripture. The book of Judges is a great example of it. You see this cycle over and over again where people um, and societies go through these really apocalyptic times. And then after that, there's sort of this rebirth of society, sort of this resurrection even of society, whatever that society is that goes through the apocalypse. And I think that that's the beauty of apocalyptic literature is that it hands down to all of us, all the future generations, it hands down to us that um, there is meaning behind what is happening and the meaning is more important than the events. And that's why we have to be careful when we interpret it literally, because it's trying to show us that these things are going to happen again and again and again and again. And the hope is, is that subsequent generations will learn from the apocalypses of the previous generation. So what are the apocalyptic books of the Bible? Uh, the primary ones we think of now, you'll find this genre in different places throughout Scripture. Um, but the primary places are the Old Testament, the book of Daniel, uh, and then parts of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Joe, and Zechariah. Definitely going to find apocalyptic language in there. The New Testament is primarily in the book of Revelation. Like that's the first spot we think of um, in terms of being a, an apocalyptic piece of literature in the New Testament. But you will also find apocalyptic uh, style in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, um, even in John. And you also see it in the writings of um, of uh, the epistles, particularly Thessalonians, which is where we get that, you know, um, the whole idea of a trumpet blowing and an angel descending and then Jesus coming and everybody being raptured. We'll talk about that later, too, in the air. Um, but that's found in the epistles. So what are the features of apocalyptic literature? Like, how do we know we're looking at apocalyptic literature when we look at it? Well, we know because of its use of symbols. Um, apocalyptic literature, like I said earlier, really depends on and really um, uses and employs language around symbols, primarily symbols from the natural world, like stars and fire and blood and smoke and sweat and all that kind of stuff. Uh, there's usually a, a, a sense of something that's unfulfilled um, in apocalyptic literature, like there's some hope out there that the apocalyptic literature is presenting, some some unfulfilled need, some unfulfilled reckoning uh, that is still yet to come. Visions and dreams also feature very strongly in apocalyptic literature. Um, a lot of mythology. Now, mythology, I know a lot of Christians especially, they push back against the, this term, but mythology is super important. It's how it's how generations um, pass down knowledge and wisdom, because even though they told stories that may not be exactly accurate, it doesn't mean that they don't give us truth. And even though we say things like, you know, this is a symbol and it's not literal, doesn't mean it's any less important. In fact, in some ways, the symbols are more important than the literal world, especially in spiritual matters. So mythology, you'll see a lot of that mythologizing. Um, some good examples of this are like, you know, um, the Son of Man is kind of this mythological feature in the Old Testament. We don't know who he is. In the New Testament, that name is attributed to Jesus. That title is attributed to Jesus. But in the Old Testament, there's th this sort of messianic figure, um, the Son of Man. He appears in the fire of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Um, he's mentioned in the book of Ezekiel several times. But that's sort of a mythological figure, right? Like this figure, we don't know who he is or what he is, but he symbolizes um, this bringing of God's reckoning, this bringing of God's judgment, and this bringing of God's peace, which in Jewish thought was shalom. It's not just the absence of violence. It's actually a holistic sort of um, healing of the world. Apocalyptic literature also uh, uses a lot of repetitions and refrains. And again, this is why I think that really it's trying to tell us that these things are cyclical. Um, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. Numerology is big in uh, apocalyptic literature. Again, numbers aren't going anywhere. And apocalyptic literature usually uh, focuses on some sort of climactic moment that is known as the end of the age or the end of the world. So that's that's what when we look at literature, that's how we're defining uh, and identifying um, apocalyptic literature in in the Bible.
So like I said earlier, there's different ways to interpret these these you know this genre. Um, some people interpret solely literal, uh, which is you know everything described in an apocalyptic story will happen. You know, uh, and again, this is the people who believe that frog demon frogs are going to come out of the ocean, that scorpions are going to come out of the ground. You might notice a little bit of it, of doubt and hesitation in my voice when I say that because I don't. I'm not a literal, I don't interpret it literally. I think that, I actually think, and I know the literalists, they they do not see it this way, but I actually think that interpreting it literally steals the actual meaning of the apocalyptic literature from the text. I'll expound upon that as we go. Another way of interpretation is just interpreting it totally mythical. Um, which means that the events may not occur literally, but the overall outcome is the same, right? The meaning of, of, of what would happen is the same. So in other words, in this sense, you'd say, well, you know, in an apocalyptic scene in which fire comes from heaven and it just burns everything up, that maybe that's not going to happen literally. Maybe that's a symbol for something else, the burning away of something else. And then there's the allegorical, and allegorical is similar to myth, um, but allegorical really doesn't ever refer to any actual events, but rather is, is read and understood just to be some sort of hidden moral truth, right? Like the apocalyptic literature isn't really about the future, it isn't about the past, it isn't about bringing meaning to these situations, it's just a story um, to present some sort of hidden moral truth. You know, out of these, I'm more of a mythical interpreter, but I do believe, though, and I think that's it important, that the events that the apocalypse is referring to happening, uh, whether it be in the past, the present, or the future, that they're real events. Like, people actually live them out. Like, the exile actually happened, right? The, uh, um, the diaspora literally happened. Like, these things really happen, um, but the symbolism of the, of the literature is mythical in nature to capture its meaning. So yes, it is like it refers to something literal. And obviously there's going to be pieces of it that are literal. And I will say, like, I'm not saying it's all symbolism. I, I do believe that there is the, these apocalypse, there are these apocalyptic moments in which God breaks in to the human story in such a way that it causes disruptions in the natural world. I'm not opposed to that. I actually think that is true. I think a, a lot of Christians shy away now from talking about the meaning of storms or of earthquake. I don't know why we shy away from that. It's like all of our ancestors looked at these things and tried to gather meaning from them, but somehow we're too modern to gather meaning from it, spiritual meaning. And I think that's a misstep as well. It's not okay to like blame entire groups of people for natural disasters. At the same time, I don't think it's okay to be like, ah, God would never cause a natural disaster. Okay. You know more about God than I do, I guess. Because uh, I don't know enough about God to say that that's true. Um, I feel like God in some way is still sovereign. Well, I know he is. I mean, I believe in some way God is still sovereign. And I know a lot of my modern um, colleagues do not really like to use that idea or term about God's sovereignty. But if God is God and we are just finite beings, then who are we to say what God can't or cannot can or cannot do? So I think that um, apocalyptic times do bring meaning. I think it's okay to take the literal um, incidences that that happen to us or that we know are going to happen to us and ascribe meaning to them through symbols um, so that they can be better understood and transmitted as a way of, 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 of wisdom, delivering the wisdom to future generations. All right, so let's talk about, so that's apocalyptic literature, which is where a lot of the end of the world stuff comes from, and it is a Jewish genre. So let's talk about Jewish, the Jewish belief about the end of the world, okay, because Christian, Christianity, remember, Jesus was a Jew, Christianity sprung out of Judaism, so what did Jews believe about the end of the world? Well, you know, in the Jewish scriptures, there's a lot of talk about the day of the Lord, uh, this is um, a phrase that appears multiple times in the Hebrew Bible, um, which is the Christian Old Testament. <laughs> and um, it's similar to the near, I should say Eastern, not Easter. It's similar to the near Eastern ancient phrase, day of conquest. And so the day of the Lord or a day of conquest. Uh, it, was, um, it was a day in which the king would boast after a great victory. And it usually points to, 
in the Old Testament, it usually points to God's judgment as occurring within history. Um, so there are some passages that um, hint to a judgment um, beyond this life, okay? But then there are also verses that hint to judgment in this world. So Daniel 12, verses 1 through 3 uh, is a verse that promises that many who have died will awake and some to everlasting life and some to everlasting contempt. And we'll read that in just a moment. So just so you understand, in the Old Testament, there is a belief. It's, it doesn't really talk about the end of the world so much, but there is this belief in the day of the Lord, like this climactic moment in which God um, will make everything right. Uh, this moment in which God will judge the living and the dead and in which God will deliver divine justice. So here's the passage from Daniel 12, 1 through 3. At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteous and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So there we see in the Old Testament, in the Jewish Bible, that there is a belief in this this apocalyptic moment in which God and his angels will participate in a final judgment or a judgment of some sort in which the um, some will be sent into everlasting shame and some will be sent into everlasting life. So son of man is another term that comes up a lot. Son of man comes up um, and um, and it refers to a heavenly supernatural figure that often appears in apocalyptic literature and the Hebrew Bible. Um, I was going to look this up here. God's ancient, um, God's um, agent of judgment and salvation. So I was trying to find um, where it's referred to, where Jesus refers to it um, multiple times. And, and people refer to him as the son of man. So he is a self-reference and there's um, a reference that he gives to other people. And we'll talk about that maybe in part two. I'll, I'll throw that in to make sure we talk about that a little more. But I have some stuff here from the Old Testament talking about the son of man. Um, I was watching in the night visions and behold, one like the son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. So first century. So that's that's what the ancient Hebrew scriptures say about the end of the world. So what did first century Jews like? How did how did the Jews of Jesus's uh, generation? How did they interpret all of that? Well, there were two. Uh, primary sects of Jews who had beliefs about the end times and they were the Pharisees and the Sadducees and they had a very different belief system about the end of the world. The Pharisees believed in a final resurrection and judgment at the end of the world. Uh, so they believed that there would be a, that everyone that who had ever died would resurrect and then there would be a judgment of all those souls. The Sadducees, however, did not believe in a final resurrection uh, or a future state of existence. Like, this was it. Um, so they did have some, both groups had some apocalyptic leanings, but they were very different in how far that went. The Pharisees, much more like the Christians of today, the Pharisees believed in a resurrection and an end of the world and like something after that, um, whereas the Sadducees did not. The Sadducees kind of viewed life as you know, just the, the, the lived experience, and that was it. Now, both of those groups, though, did anticipate uh, a coming Messiah. And they had, obviously, different views about what that would look like in the end. But, um, but first century Jews anticipated the Messiah and believed that he would bring about the end of Roman oppression and usher in a new age. And, in a, and, and that in itself, the Messiah would be a son of man figure. He would be sort of this hero type figure which is very much rooted in their, um, in their apocalyptic literature. 
Okay, so what did Jesus say about the end of the world? So we've got the Old Testament, um, and we've got the Jews and what they believed. But Jesus also, in that context, has some things that he said about the world. So in Matthew, end of the world. So in Matthew 24, Jesus talks about the coming of the Son of Man um, and the end of the age in response to, um, hold on me, okay. (laughs) In response to, the disciples' questions about his prophecy that the temple will be destroyed. So, I think I've had this on a on a on a slide coming up. But basically, the disciples asked Jesus uh, in Matthew 24, "What will be the sign of the coming of the Son of Man and of the end of the age?" And Jesus responds in apocalyptic language. Um, he responds about a time coming when there will be wars and famines and earthquakes and persecution and false Christ and a darkened sun and moon. Um, The sounding of a great trumpet is mentioned there and the angels gathering the elect. But there's a curious verse in there. Well, there's two curious things that happen. Number one, notice what the disciples are asking. Um, The disciples are asking, what is the sign of your coming? Not of your second coming, because he hadn't left yet. (laughs) This is always read that way, though. It's always read as if Jesus is answering the question about the second coming. It doesn't make sense to me that Jesus Jesus is talking about the second coming in Matthew 24 because he hasn't even left yet. Um, And curiously, in this section, Jesus sort of ends it by saying, Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away, by no means pass away. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Now, I've always read this section, obviously, very differently than many of my peers, because, number one, he's not asked about the second coming. The Jews, the disciples don't even know there's going to be a second coming. Uh, He hasn't left yet. They're asking him, when, when is he going to establish his messiahship? When is he going to let the world know that he's the guy, okay, that he is the Son of God, he is the Messiah they've been waiting on? Jesus gives them lots of language, apocalyptic, which does happen in the generation of the disciples. And he says this going to, he says, Surely I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away. So the people listening to him were not going to die before the things he said took place. That's important. A lot of Christians interpret Matthew 24 as futuristic. I don't see how you interpret it as only futuristic. Now, you might interpret it as cyclical, the things that were and are and are to, and that were and are and are to come, and say, okay, this can be applied to the future. And I'm totally fine with that. But Jesus isn't talking about things that haven't happened yet, in my opinion. Jesus is telling them things that are going to happen between now and 70 AD in their generation, and all those things did happen. Um, if they happen again, it's just because the things that were and are and are to come are cyclical. Mark 13, Jesus again, this is another version of this. Uh, It's called Mark's Little Apocalypse. And in this one, Jesus answers the disciples' questions, and he again says, Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth won't even pass away. But my words, uh, excuse me, sorry, let me say that again. Heaven and earth will surely pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. But of that day and hour, no one knows. So that's an important thing, right? Jesus keeps saying, again, Luke 21, we see it again, the same thing over and over again. Guys, I'm going to give you an apocalypse, but two things to be aware of. Number one, um, it's for you. This generation will not pass away until all these things take place, okay? All these things take place, number one. And number two, not only are these things going to take place, but stop trying to use them as a way to chart out a timeline or to say, okay, this is that, or that is this to be careful with that because only God really knows the dates and the times and the, and the finality of those things. The gospel of John really doesn't talk about um, the end of the world too much within it. Now, let me say this. Jesus doesn't have an apocalyptic thing in there, but John writes revelation. And so there's tons of apocalyptic imagery in the gospel of John, the epistles of John and the book of revelation. Jesus does talk about um, the last day, uh, which is interesting because he doesn't use the phrase son of man or the coming of the son of man. He says, and this is the will of him who sent me that everyone who sees the son and believes in him 
may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Um, and in the story of Lazarus in the book of John, Jesus refers to him refers to himself as the resurrection and the life, and he does this in response to um, Mary's reference of a resurrection at the last day. So Mary was part of the Pharisee belief. She believed there'll be a resurrection at the last day. So what did the apostles say about the end of the world? Um, well, the New Testament letters are full of references to the last days, tribulations, and the second coming of Christ. Um, primarily um, that these things will take place, and in some cases have already taken place, and in the fashion of um, in the fashion of some of the apocalyptic symbols employed by Jesus, we also see angels, trumpets coming in the clouds, signs in the sun and moon and stars, etc. All that is is in the in the uh, in the writings of the epistles. So it's clear that there has always been a belief in the end, end of the world in the Judeo-Christian uh, syst- uh, system, religions, um, Jewish and Christ- Judaism and Christianity. Um, the end of the world is is mostly described and talked about in context of um, in the context of the uh, the uh, the use of apocalyptic literature, symbols, and things like that. Um, so next part two, let me go ahead and kind of give you a heads up. So that that sums up part one. Um, part two is gonna be in the next video, and we're gonna talk about um, what the early what did the early church believe about the end of the world. So we've got up to the apostles. And now we're going to talk about what the early church believes. So we've, we've done the G- ancient Jews, we, we've done Jesus, we've done the apostles, and now we're going to look what the early church believed about the end of the world. And then in part two, we're going to talk about what do churches today believe about the end of the world. And there's really four um, sort of thought processes slash theologies that churches today use to uh, talk about the end of the world dispensationalism that's the most popular here in the south especially among pentecostals and baptists and most evangelicals millennialism and amillennialism we'll talk a little bit about the difference between those two uh talk about preterism uh, and then conclude by talking about the already but not yet idea which is better summed up as it's just the end of the world as we know it i hope this is helpful i will see you in part two